Hey, what's up? This is Patrick. Welcome to episode 23 of the Double ETF podcast, everything except the football. I hope you guys are doing great. Today, we have Hector Contreras out of Massachusetts. And here is a little peek behind the curtain for you. This time, for this episode, I had someone else doing the editing. My schedule got crazy and I had to uh, outsource that part. I like the result. The rhythm of the conversation is different, a little bit different than in the previous episodes. I also like some of the decisions that were made. So no, that was interesting uh, for me, and I hope the conversation will be interesting for you as well. If you want to contribute, you can join the awesome club like uh, Carly did twice, like Kevin, like Josh, like Nick, like Embags, and like uh, Hector, actually. Thank you again to all of you fine people. Feel free to join in. Uh, you can do so at paypal.me slash eetfpod. Or if you want to leave us a review, please go ahead on uh, iTunes and wherever you listen to podcasts. Also, you want to drop us a line, you can do so at eetfpod on Twitter or eetfpodcast at gmail.com. So without further ado... Here is my conversation with Hector Contreras. Thanks. All right. With me today, I have the pleasure of welcoming to the show Hector Contreras. How are you, sir? I'm doing well, Patrick. How are you today? Ah, oh, good, good. As usual, trying to survive the week. It's been hell. It's <laughs> yes. just uh, just trying to get through it. Just a slog. Just I can't wait for the weekend. All right. So I'll start with the usual open-ended question. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, well, yeah, my name, I'm Hector Contreras. Um, I live in Holden, Massachusetts, which is in central Massachusetts, pretty much uh, five minutes from the center point of the state uh, where uh, in the town over, which is Rutland. And uh, I am actually pretty native to this area. This is all part of Worcester County. And uh, I grew up in Shrewsbury, Massachusetts, um, which is about uh, 20 minutes, 25 minutes uh, east of here. So kind of a, a local <laughs> townie, as they call it. Um, I've been living here for the last uh, th two years now. We bought the house in 2019. Um, which dodged a bullet because uh, if we had waited another year, we would have tried to buy a house during the pandemic, which would have sucked. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And uh, has it been the same um, for you guys as well? The real estate prices have been skyrocketing? Unreal. We have moved like f five or six times. It's it's ridiculous from apartment to apartment. And the last one we lived in, we bought because it was kind of, we were in a bind. We had looked at a house prior to and uh, it fell through. So we ended up just trying to get an apartment before our renewal. Mm -hmm. So uh, on the last apartment, the last apartment before that flooded. Jesus. So we were uh, we were we were trying to get out. And so when we found this other apartment, it was a small two bedroom. And meanwhile, you know, while we were living there, we were trying to find a house. And uh, had we not been successful in finding a house, we would have had our second child Wow. And uh, which we did have it in the apartment, but only for uh, three weeks, four weeks until we and we bought the house. So we dodged a bullet by not having to stay in a small two bedroom with uh, two kids. And, and it would have just been rough. But uh, but luckily, yeah, we moved here um, and uh, it all kind of worked out in a way. Nice. And um, what about uh, what about work in, in what field do you uh, you work? I am in the uh, I'm in the insurance world, which is kind of like a once you hear that, it's like dun, 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 <laughs> like no one wants yeah. to hear that story. Yeah, it's so boring. Um, I'm an underwriter, so I'm basically the gatekeepers, you know, quote unquote, of uh, you're having an insurance policy with the company or not. I scan through your property and, and review it to make sure it's up to code and there's no deficiencies and make sure that uh, you're getting a, the, the right amount of coverage and just basically trying to make sure everything is fair. And then I underwrite the house and if it flies, then we go with it. And if it doesn't, then, you know, it goes back and they have to uh, mm -hmm. fix anything that, that needs to be fixed and, and so forth. And um, how long have you been doing that? I have been doing that for almost six years now. And uh, I, when I started, I'm like the jack of all trades where I have done somewhere in the vicinity of 20 to 25 different temporary positions okay. in my 
in my career. Um, I, I'm basically that song from you two. You know, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. <laughs> okay. You know, I went to school for psychology and I never ended up going in that field. So I just kind of fell into things by accident. I have been doing uh, you know, job after job after job. And, uh, you know, you look at my resume and you're just like, what the hell, man? <laughs> you, you, you know, I've done everything from counting to lab technician to, to insurance and, and, and just a number of different things. So nothing is very linear. But ultimately, uh, yeah, I fell into this through a temporary staffing agency doing more like a customer service with insurance agents and just handle claims and handle policy work and stuff like that. And then I moved my way up and got my insurance license and my broker's license and been doing underwriting for about two years now. Okay. But you you mentioned uh, studying psychology. What did you want to be originally? I was fascinated with human behavior. And I don't know if I actually knew what I wanted to do with it. I just always knew that I, I had a, an interest in it. So I, I guess people thought that maybe I'd fall into as a psychiatrist or something like that. But I don't know. I didn't know if that was going to be something I would wanted to pursue, if that would have been taxing or even to, to continue education. I was I was sort of done after I got my bachelor's okay. degree. So I, I didn't want to pursue a master's degree just from fatigue from doing that. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so so ultimately, I just kind of really the thing with psychology is if you don't pursue after you get your undergraduate degree, your, your options are very limited. So that's where I fell into doing uh, all sorts of other odd jobs. And um, which college did you go to? I went to three different colleges, Patrick. <laughs> so Jesus. I started at U. <laughs> a lot of jobs, yeah, a lot, a lot of, of colleges. Yeah, I, again, indecisive Hector. Um, <laughs> I started at uh, the University of Maine, where I actually, I didn't have a degree. So it was just general academics. Mm-hmm. And then I did not do well there. I mostly spent my time listening to music, <laughs> which is, you know, every parent's nightmare, right? You go away from your house and you live on your own and you're on campus. And I had been playing the guitar for a number of years. And I had been in a band prior to uh, moving up to Maine. I took my acoustic guitar with me and I just started playing, uh, you know, random gigs here and there. And just, and I just really just, sat on my ass and just listened to CDs and, you know, MP3s, you know, this was the, the, the age of, uh, Napster. Actually, yeah, Napster. So it was like, I think that was, that was it, right? The year 2000. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Something I like that. 99, that. 2000. So yeah, that, that really was the height of that era. So at that point I might as well just been studying music instead of, uh, you know, general <laughs> academics. Um, I did so bad. They kicked me out cause I was doing so poor. And then I ended up going back home and Going to a community college in Worcester, mm -hmm. I ended up doing early childhood education because okay. my mother was a teacher and, and assistant vice principal. So I had a, a good way of working with uh, young kids and then educating young kids and stuff like that. So I thought, well, I, I'm, I'm really good at it. So why don't I pursue an early childhood education degree at this uh, two-year college. And I did actually end up getting my associate's degree in early childhood education, which when I went to pursue my bachelor's, it was kind of a no-brainer to finish my early childhood education with a bachelor's. And stupid me decides that I'm going to switch majors <laughs> when I go to my four-year college after that. And I ended up going into psychology because I was less interested in early childhood education for a number of reasons, one of which was just that it, it just felt like I was in a field where I was surrounded. It's just my personal experience. I was with other educators that did not respect the, not the craft, but just didn't like what they were, you know, calling kids little shits and just not, and it just, it just, I was, I was, it, it discouraged me quite a bit and it should have, it should have done the opposite. It should have encouraged me to mm -hmm. be like a better educator, but it did the opposite. And I feel, I, to this day, I feel horrible about it, the, but that I ended up wanting to switch majors um, because I was more interested at that point of, to see why people are the way they are. So ended up pursuing psychology and I ended up finishing my four year uh, with a psychology major at the uh, at Worcester State University. And uh, you mentioned the University of Maine a few minutes ago. Uh, they are usually part of the uh, hockey tournament every year, right? That Yeah, they, they are a good team. But what's the name of that team? Uh, to this day, couldn't tell you. <laughs> okay. No, it's, uh, it's something with the Black Bears or something like that. Okay. God, this is being recorded. So somebody out there is screaming their head out at me. <laughs> That's okay. Um, but yeah, it's like it's like the the main black bears or something like that. Um, God, okay, I I uh, a, not the golden bears. That's not it. That's uh, California, I think. I I could look it up. But, uh, 
let's leave it as it is and uh, leave yeah. the mystery. Again, uh, I spent my time in a in a dorm room uh, with headphones on and uh, you know just just listening to music. So I never I was the antisocial, even though I wasn't doing it on purpose. I, if you wanted to find me, I'd I'd be in my room just plugged in and, and listening to music or playing music. So um, sports was not uh, on my radar for college. Has it ever been on your radar or you're just not a sports I'm guy? I'm not generally a sports guy. However, there it's hard not to be a, I'm not going to say a participant, but it's hard not to be associated with it because of where I live. Yes. Being outside of Boston, you can't not have some sort of paraphernalia of a sports <laughs> team. Um, whether it be a, a Red Sox hoodie or, you know, a, a Celtics shirt or a Bruins cap, always something that even if, you know, if you don't buy it, someone buys it for you. <laughs> I never mention it, whether we're in our name that tune meetings or with people from other areas, because just knowing that I live in an area where we're one of the most hated states sports wise <laughs> because of that. Not that I'm saying it's a bad thing because it's not totally my thing, but let's go through the numbers, right? You have the Celtics. They won the title in 2008. The Red Sox won in 2004, 2007. Uh, yes, something like that, yeah. 2013, I think, was another one. And then 2018, just uh, just a few years ago. And then the Bruins won in 2011. Yes. And then the Patriots, God, I'm, I'm not even going to say. So I try not to talk about it because uh, <laughs> it just brings up bad juju with everybody. For a long time, the, uh, the entire state didn't win anything at all. That's correct. Until the Patriots. And the Patriots. Well, well, that's because uh, Bill Parcells was the head coach. And yes. prior to Brady stepping out on the field, it was a hit or miss, mostly a miss. And I didn't really like him as a coach. I thought he was a blowhard. And then, you know, in comes this basically it's a completely new organization, a new franchise, because you have a new head coach, you have a new star quarterback, and then you start getting in all these new running backs and defensive backs and all these players and it turns into a whole new team. So... That was uh, what they call the dynasty, yes. which is uh, not anymore. But I think there was a gap, maybe 15 years, between the last Celtics championship yes. and the first Patriots championship. There was a gap of about, I don't know, 10 or 12 years that yeah. nothing was won. Yeah. Uh, and then everything changed. As you said, the Bruins mm -hmm. won, Celtics won again, Yep. Um, Red Sox won a bunch, and Patriots uh, won a ton as well. <laughs> yep. I had the opportunity to go to game four, I decided not to get the tickets. And I, I don't remember the reason why, um, but I just remember that I had a date night with my, at that time, fiance. Do I kick myself about it? Uh, some days, but, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, it, it, we, we ended up watching the game together. You know, it's, it's, it's one of those things. It's like, you, you see the footage and it, it just doesn't, it doesn't really capture it at the, at the moment. It was just insane. It, it was, it was just unreal because It was what it was. It was nineteen oh, not nineteen oh, nineteen eighteen, nineteen eighteen. Yeah, yeah. It was. It, it's just too too long, Patrick. <laughs> yes. Oh yeah. I know absolutely. I'm a um, LA Kings fan since they traded for Gretzky, and I waited twenty three years until they won the Stanley yeah. Cup. So I, I get yeah. what you mean. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Okay. So you mentioned earlier that you had a bunch of jobs. Yeah. Um, which one of them was your favorite? Now that you can look back, I mean, that was a good time. That was a good job. Um, I will say, this is going to sound weird, but the one that I think was most invested prior to this one, oddly enough, was at Barnes and Noble in Worcester. And the reason why is because I worked with a close friend of mine. Uh, his name is Jim. And he he's another music nut like I am. And we worked in a music department that uh, that we kind of customized to our liking because they <laughs> they basically have a you know a, a certain amount of you know media that they put out so CDs, DVDs, Blu-rays, things like that. I ended up training him, but I was kind of going to school in the meantime, so I was only working part time. He was really diligent and very meticulous about what he wanted to do with the department. So he took a position as a manager for the music department and. We together worked on just putting in what we thought would be just great music. Didn't matter what sold because we didn't care. Okay. You know, we just we basically treated it like a privately owned, independently owned record store. So we we brought in like 
any you know you look through our our name that tune music that we we go through and mm-hmm. it was like you, you could throw a dart and it was just like we had it we had uh if you wanted to hear you know uh any any aor album from the from the late 70s and, and early 80s we, we we would find a way to get it for you um <laughs> you know we we, we he was really good at that, and he had worked in independent record stores in the past, and he, he had a knack for it. He taught me a lot that I just I carried on to this day, so I, I really thank him for being the inspiration. And uh, you didn't get any pressure from management to you know put the best-selling albums there or don't buy that or... Yes and no. I mean, there's it's not management in the store. You know, they, they basically send out what you have to sell. Uh, and put those on, mm-hmm. you know, kiosks and end caps and stuff like that. But after that, we would just special order stuff. You know, we had a computer that you could just do a search and, and just order whatever we wanted to. Because it was like, if you go to a Barnes and Noble and you are looking for something that they don't have in stock, there's a fancy little computer that you can type in what you're looking for, get it, and it'll be in mm-hmm. in about two weeks. Okay. And uh, that's basically what we were doing. We we're basically acting like customers, special ordering uh, <laughs> music and then just bringing it into the store just just so we could keep it there. The best part about it is that we were catching a lot of audiences from from those independent record stores and they were, we were catching wind there and they were like, oh, wow, these this guys are bringing in music that it's hard to find. Or, you know, we, we don't want to wait time on, on eBay. Um, so it's now we can just go into our local store and, and go pick up whatever it is we you know we were looking for it mm, nice and uh, how long did you work there oh gosh three and a half years i think could have been longer but it's, my memory is is hazy but yeah about three and a half years it, while i was in and out of school and also working at a uh, working a second job ink production which is you're going to raise a lot of questions but basically i was <laughs> uh i was working in a lab which was uh also kind of like a, a warehouse for creating metallic inks for like paints and for wallpapers and things like that. Um, and I was basically a, a scientist, <laughs> you know, I'd, I'd go in and I'd wow. put on a, a uniform and, and it was filthy. And, you know, I'd, I'd bring in drums of, of different ingredients that you have to mix in with a giant drill, like a, like hundred gallon drums of, of uh, gosh, it, like paste. And I don't even know the, the ingredients anymore. It's been so long, but you know, you, you basically <laughs> become your own scientist and make a, this, a list of items all together. And, and then you make some sort of either paint or I don't know, a, a number of things that they have to then test the viscosity and measure that and make sure that it, it's uh, to the right uh, specifications. And then you have to ship it out to whatever vendor is requesting it. It was doing two jobs and going to school. It was hell. <laughs> you could have been the next uh, Walter White. <laughs> yeah, I preamble to yeah, me cooking meth, of course. So um, how come you um, left uh, Barnes & Noble? I had to finish my last year. I was only doing part-time sem- like I was only doing a couple credits because I was working two other jobs. And then I had to leave Barnes & Noble because that one wasn't making as much money as the other job. And I was also going to school okay. and also with a, a fiancé at the time. So trying to juggle everything and, and yeah. paying rent is uh, – People ask me, how did you do it? You, you just do it. You don't, there's no, there's, there was no other solution, but just doing it. You don't really have a choice. Yeah. Almost. You mentioned uh, playing guitar in college. Did you come from a uh, musical family? Like Not uh, really. My father only really listened to NPR. In Massachusetts, it, it's 1030 AM WBZ, which is just a morning radio. And uh, he's claims all, oh, but the music of my generation is, is the best music there is. So when I was growing up, uh, he listened to a radio station called Oldies 103.3, which it does not exist anymore. But at the time, the Oldies was the music of the late 50s and 60s. He would play that on the in the car. And that, I think, fostered my growth in music because I definitely took an interest in you know, everything from you know, Beach Boys to Otis Redding to Marvin Gaye, et cetera, et cetera. So it was just a number of uh, a number of artists from that from those decades. That was it. That was it for him. So my mother had more of a musical taste, but she she was more contemporary. So we were listening to more like Chicago, so seventies and eighties with her. Okay. And then you know, essentially, I think it, mine was just more self instilled. I started mm-hmm. picking up music. Uh, independently. My sister is five years older than me. So she had records that I would steal from her when she was away. <laughs> and and then the same thing with the guitar. She actually bought an acoustic guitar and she left college and I took her acoustic guitar, which she didn't take with her to college. And 
I was playing it and playing it and playing it. And I remember I broke a, a string and I remember calling her because there was no internet. I said, hey, how do you replace a string? She's like, you broke my string? I said, yeah. She goes, you figure it out. And she hung up. <laughs> <laughs> and I did. I figured it out. And since then, I have I was playing guitar nonstop. So, and then that was, I'm going to say that was like from seventh grade uh, until I went to probably my pretty much after I headed off to University of Maine. So that was a good run that I was playing. It. And I still have my guitars and I, I just need to dust them off. And, and I keep telling myself I'm going to get back into it, back into it. I need to actually do it. So. So you're self-taught pretty much. You never took uh, lessons. No, I took two weeks worth of lessons. That I, it was mostly, you know why? I took two lessons because I wanted to learn how to play stuff that, you know, I, I would, what I would do, I had the boom box and I would take the tape and I'd put on the radio and I'd press record whenever a song came up. Then I would just play that song over and over again. I'd rewind it, play it <laughs> and try to play along with it, rewind it, do it again and just wear out the tapes and there was you know maybe a handful of songs that i was like i don't know what what tuning they are doing this in you know this again before the internet mm -hmm. so i was like well, how are they playing the song so i think maybe if i get some lessons i can just do that i don't actually want to know how, how to read music i know how to play the saxophone and i can read music for the saxophone but for guitar it was a little different i didn't want to i didn't want to learn any more than i already did i just wanted to just play it so i was like i'll just take the lessons just so i can learn those songs and then i can be done two lessons and i was like okay i got it i'm done <laughs> So did you uh, learn the saxophone in uh, high school or something? I learned the saxophone in fourth grade. And oh. and that was, you had to take a musical elective if you weren't going to do sports. And I wanted to do the guitar then, but they only had two positions and they were both filled. Then I wanted to do the drums and those were filled. By default, <laughs> it was either the clarinet or the saxophone. And my friend ended up with the clarinet and I ended up with the saxophone. Jesus. And and everyone at that time, it was Bill Clinton was huge at playing mm -hmm. saxophone. So it was like, oh, you're going to be just like Bill Clinton. My, my Everyone in my family is like, you're, you're playing the saxophone just like Bill Clinton. You get, I'm going to get you some sunglasses. I'm like, oh, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I'm good. Thank you. Um, but yeah, that saxophone, I can still play. I haven't picked up the saxophone patrick since i left high school but i played from fourth grade till i graduated high school that i am sure mm. that if i picked up a saxophone today i could still play the shit out of it i probably. think it's one of those things like they always say you know you, you never forget how to ride a bicycle it's probably the same vein <laughs> So, um, okay, so Clinton in fourth grade. Uh, well, I mean, I might as well be really rude and ask you how old you are. I am 39. And like that that era, that time, it, you know, you, you go in through the emotions of like having to be, I was in the marching band, I was in the concert band. And um, my desires were more into like into playing the guitar or, or listening to music. I also had taken an interest in watching a ton of movies. Believe it or not, that's probably more explainable than the music thing because my father took us to the movies quite often. And when I talked with somebody a couple of years ago and I explained the story as like, well, my father just took us to the movies all the time. And, and she says he probably did that because he didn't have anything to say to you guys. And that my brain exploded. I'm like, maybe that could be <laughs> part of why we went to the movies so much. But also, I think he just generally likes movies and TV because he was a couch potato. He's not that he was unhealthy or anything like that. He was a very fit guy. He was a Vietnam veteran. But I think he just loved watching his own. He He's a very black and white. Like he loved, I was going to say Bonanza, but that's in color. But like Lone Ranger, Perry Mason, okay. um, he just loves watching things from his time my but my, my father was born in 1947 so everything from the 60s is is his generation mm -hmm. yeah but he took us to the movies quite often after we got older you know me and my sister would just go and then after she got older and didn't want to hang around with her little brother i would just go <laughs> either and this is going to sound so lame, but I, if, if I didn't go with friends, I would be happy to just go by myself to a movie because uh, I'd rather go and see a movie and say I either liked it or I didn't like it. But, you know, when you can't drive and you don't have a license yet yeah. and where I lived, you couldn't really bike to like to anywhere like there was no malls it was just you know small sh or shops and stuff like that and 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 the video store mm -hmm. and so i would ride my bike to the, the video store and rent you know three movies a weekend or i'd tape something off tv at the time 
Um, so that's pretty much where that came from. And I tried to make friends that also had similar interests in me with either music or movies. But that was a lot of my younger years was just going and renting movies and just kind of like goodwill hunting, just like I got to know what, who did this and who produced this and what other movies did this. So <laughs> I, I just became like an encyclopedia Britannica of movies. Um, that, that I make that joke that no one knows what that is. I'll just say Wikipedia. <laughs> no, Encyclopedia Britannica, I know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a lot of my upbringing. And then once those small mom and pop video stores went away, then Blockbuster came in and mm -hmm. I, and then Netflix and then so forth and so on. But uh, but yeah, my heart really was in those smaller video rental stores. The one in Shrewsbury was called Video Warehouse. It was basically the, the size of a well, size of a mini mart. You know, it's a very small you could you could go through several rows, but it was not like Blockbuster. Blockbuster became like big box store of video rentals and yeah. and took over and it was it was a little sad when that happened and a little tear went down my eye but i uh but i really loved the, the small ones because you could kind of talk with the people there and and pick out what you wanted and those those days are long gone now you just have everything is in the cloud so i, I yeah. and i don't get me wrong i have a digital library i run through voodoo which is kind of like the itunes um where you just go through movies and movies and i have lots of movies on there and i'll do the same thing i'll scroll through them and and i, I don't know what it is i have to look at movie box art for some reason that that just takes me back and i get a such a thrill from looking at that as opposed to going and looking at a bunch of text for what video to watch so yeah that's yeah. <laughs> such a nerdy thing but yeah i just i love looking at artwork i think when i i think if i had a mansion i would have a private room of just like movie posters and record album covers and just and my wife would probably divorce me so there'd be papers but <laughs> i don't know I, I get such a kick out of that i love the artwork especially when it's like really good like old movie artwork and really good record album covers it just it's it, that's more a thrill for me you you probably know about those uh polish uh movie posters right or do you know what i'm talking about oh so oh i know i i'm i don't we're probably talking about two different things but i i know of like when big blockbuster movies get it ported over from other countries and then you see like they draw something from a scene from that movie that may not have nothing to do with the actual movie yeah And the style is psychedelic almost. And uh -huh. most of the times it's uh, from Eastern Europe, yes. either like Poland or... Yes. You know what I'm talking about. Okay. Yeah, there's a, there's, a, there's a poster for the movie Alien. You, you might want to Google the movie Alien and look up international posters. And some of them are weird way out there wacky yeah. posters and um yeah it's so fascinating yeah. to see some of those because they have nothing to do with the actual movie yeah uh, alien terminator and star wars, star wars have good yeah, ones that was huge in fact yeah. there was star wars uh, i'm gonna butcher the story but yeah there was a didn't somebody make a ripoff of star wars or they used the scenes from star wars to make their own movie and i want to say it was like a in the middle east but i could be wrong oh no no i'm i'm sorry not middle east it was in india Turkish. Turkish? Isn't it like Turkish Star Turkish Wars? Turkish Star Wars. Thank you. Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, okay. Then, and then they filmed their own scene. I've never seen oh, it. I, though. I, I've, I, I watched it years ago, but I, I couldn't tell you what the plot to Turkish Star <laughs> Wars was. But yeah, they, they inserted all the battle shots from Star Wars and then made their own movie within it. So it was like. I think it's Turkish anyway. Yeah. Yeah. There's a movie called Son of Rambo. I don't know if you've ever seen that. Uh, but that's okay no that, that's a no it's if, if, you, if you ever get a chance watch that movie it's really good it's um okay. and it's about two boys that watch first blood the first rambo movie uh -huh. and and the boy decides after seeing that that he wants to make a rambo movie of his own so you know they get a camera they get a bunch of other kids stuff together and, and film a rambo movie called son of rambo he's the kid version of rambo and it, it's so good if you ever get a chance to, that that <laughs> i recommend that one all right Uh, and uh, you mentioned walking down memory lane w with movie posters and all that. What I remember doing is back in um, high school, we would go through the uh, yellow pages and spot video stars in Montreal. And me and my friend were looking for back then was the original Mad Max in VHS, oh, the one from yeah. the 78. And mm -hmm. that was, you know, that was before everything, you know, and yep. in this city, no one knew what Mad Max was. Yeah. You know, except for the second one. Yeah, because that was the one that that launched the, the road that franchise, warrior. right? The road warrior. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, yeah. and uh, since most people knew it as the road warrior, mm -hmm. uh, nobody knew that there was a first movie before that. Yeah, and I got a lot of blank faces when I <laughs> when I asked about, "Do you have the original Mad Max, the first one?" And I was like, "What?" 
that was the first one? Yeah, brutal. <laughs> That's the first DVD I ever bought. So when DVD first came out, I jumped on that format because I saw it at my cousin's house and I was blown away. It's like this, this, there's no scratching lines. Like you don't have to, you, you can rewind it and it looks clear still, you know, you don't have to turn it off and, <laughs> and, and put it in a VCR rewinder. It was, it was like breaking new ground. Yes. And that was the first DVD. There were two DVDs I bought. One of them was Mad Max and the other one was um, Twister. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and Twister didn't get a lot of play, but Mad Max is uh, definitely was a held up. I, I still like that movie. I need to see it again, the first one, because I remember the action sequences were awesome, despite the movie being really low budget. Yeah. The action scenes were excellent, but the rest was... Uh, it's eh. out there. It's definitely like, it's one of the things about it is it's that it was done like on what, like a tight budget. Yes. They didn't hire actors. It was like, it was, it was a whole bunch of just people that showed up that were local to, it was shot in Australia, right? Yes. And I think George Miller was still working as a doctor when he made, or as a uh, medicine student when I think you're right. did that movie. But yeah, I mean, yeah. <sighs> A lot of those movies that, that came out during that time, it was just maybe not a, a Shakespearean script. It was yes. just, it was just you know, improv and whatever lens of dialogue and then whatever we could shoot. Um, it's kind of like, imagine this what Night of the Living Dead was like. You know, he had a, uh, yeah. a short script and then just kind of shooting what you could yeah. shoot with whatever Limited time Limited budget. So, very limited. I forgot the exact name of the documentary, but there is a um, documentary out there about Australian exploitation movies, stuff like really? like. Uh, Mad Max a little bit. I'll have to and, that one. Uh, yeah, th yeah, there are there are a few uh, hidden gems in there. Australian yeah. movies, yeah. and it's it sounds stupid saying this, but it's similar to us, but still very different in many ways as a culture and lifestyle and everything. So it's it, it's really interesting to see all those you know the, those little uh, details. You know, there is a movie that I watched when when you mentioned Australia. I was thinking of a, another movie that have you ever seen Red Hill. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> that and it has nothing to do with what we're talking about. But that was probably one of the more recent Australian, and that's still like ten years ago, I think. But yeah, I really like that. One too, yeah, so. I saw it a while ago. Oh, it's it, it's like a murder uh, investigation or something. Yes, it's like a it, yeah, it's a murder investigation. It's it's like a thriller. Okay. While we are talking about Australian movies, um, I got one for you. Um, I don't know what you think of westerns. Uh, I like questions. Okay, good. Because, yeah, I got one for you, The Proposition. It is... Yes, yeah, perfect. You yes, saw it? Very good movie. Okay, good. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yep. Excellent movie. The Proposition. Yep. Excellent, excellent movie. And it's... The uh, Guy Pierce, yes, right? Yes, uh, from yeah. uh, 2005. Uh, yeah. Ray Winstone, Guy Pierce, Emily Watson, Danny Houston, John Hurt. I saw that in an independent theater. There's one in Boston and I knew nothing about it. I didn't think I see a trailer for it before. And I just kind of walked in and it was uh, the only thing playing. And no one does that. Like we always do. I joke about it with a friend of mine who runs a, a movie theater. Like who, who goes to the movie theater and just walks in and say, <laughs> what's playing? Like <laughs> everyone always plans a movie. So that was probably one of the two or three times I'd ever done that. I think I'd gotten out of a, a, a concert and if the venue was nearby and I was like, I'm not tired yet. Let me go see a movie at midnight. Nice. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that was directed by John Hillcote, who almost, uh, also did uh, Lawless a few years later. And, and uh, The Road as well, a few years later. Good uh, filmmaker. Yep. Uh, yeah, the proposition. Check it out. Yep. Excellent. My next question on my on my list is travel? Question <laughs> mark. Mm -hmm. So um, I know that you mentioned Hong Kong on Twitter a few days ago. Oh, yeah. And I'm super curious about that. <laughs> um, in 1990, my father took the family to Hong Kong as a work trip. When my wife and I, while we were married, we took a while to have kids. And my father's like, Why, what's the holdup? I said, well, I want to travel. I want to go to places. I don't, I don't want to have kids yet. I want to, I want to go visit the world. He's like, looks at me like funny. He's like, what? just, just travel with them. That's what we did. And I was like, oh yeah, we went to Hong Kong. We went to uh, Puerto Rico and we went to like all across the country. Like, Duh. And that's what he did. He didn't have money to go t take him and, and my mother traveling as much uh, unless it was related to the army. And he saved that money to go and take us to places that he could, or in this case, work paid for Hong Kong. So if I may, I'm super curious, what kind of work did your dad do? 
He worked um he worked for Digital Corporation. So Digital Corporation, at that time, he was working with a compensation benefits manager for Digital Corporation. Digital Corporation, in turn, became Compaq Presario. Oh, yeah. Okay. And you know where that goes from there, right? Compaq becomes HP and the rest is history. That's true. But he was working with Digital all the way through HP. So he's seen his company go through three huge names. And he brought home one of the first computers. Like It was a digital word processor, sepia tone, and all you could do was type. <laughs> and I loved the damn thing. It was so cool. It was just, it was a box that you could type in your stories. You didn't have to use a pen and paper to you could just type. I was I was a kid and I was typing like 20 page stories. I was just writing and writing and Jesus. writing. I just loved it. I'd take off the little printer tabs on the side. And, and I love that thing. And it, again, before graphics, yeah. <laughs> going back to a saying. So he had a business trip in Hong Kong. And I don't know how he was able to get the whole family to, to come with him on his work trip, but that's what he did. We were there for a little over three weeks. We were staying in a hotel, in a wing of the hotel with other coworkers of his. So I got to know some of the other kids of the coworkers of his. We went around to the cities and I just remember it being so crowded. You couldn't, <laughs> you couldn't drive a car on the road because... The roads were just flooded with thousands of people and everybody was trying to just make an honest buck. There was everyone was either selling food off the, you know, in markets or they were trying to sell, you know, electronics or or gadgets or gizmos or antiques or, or just a number. It was just a marketplace. And if you were walking you had to keep your eyes open because they would bike ride and they didn't care. They would plow <laughs> down the road at like record speed. And, you know, you just basically had to dodge that kind of traffic. But, <laughs> but yeah, I remember, I remember going on like boats and ugh, the, the, the water was not the cleanest water. <laughs> I, and I, I hate that that's my memory, but I just remember going out and walking the streets and just being, it was really just crowded. So you were like eight or nine? Yeah, I was nine, yeah, I was nine years old. It's, it gets crazy so to think about. The weirdest thing is I wish I knew more, I remembered more about Hong Kong itself. The memories I actually have or what movies I watched on the plane <laughs> <laughs> because it was such a long plane ride. It was like 13 hours or something like that. And if, you know, if you, not more. They, yeah, if not more, if not more, exactly. I uh, it, so I remember watching like four or five movies, and I was like, oh, I, I remember, I remember nothing about the movies, but I remember what movies I watched. <laughs> I have more memories of that than I do of actual Hong Kong, which is sad. So you went from Boston to probably LA, and then from LA to Hong Kong, I guess. I would imagine, yeah, that we would have had to have done something like that. So, but that. We were talking about how I'd never been to California. That doesn't count. If I've been to LA, <laughs> I, I, it was a layover and I, I, I don't. Technically, I, you've been, yeah. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I got, a, I got a bunch of questions, actually. You mentioned that your dad was a Vietnam veteran. Yeah. I'm sure that relatives to our previous guests, probably some of them have been to, to Vietnam. But did he ever talk about it? He doesn't really like to. He was a, he was a chopper pilot. Holy so, shit. <laughs> yeah. He was um, through the 101st Airborne and a captain. We don't really, it, it's kind of a sore subject for him. So he was, um, yeah, he was honorably discharged. And okay, he didn't he, stay, he didn't want to stay in no, the army afterwards anyway. No, af after Vietnam, he, he was he done with it. Lately. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. But, um, but yeah, he's, uh, he's not a militant man per se, but he does have some of those things that he jokes around. So when, like, for example, when we were growing up, your weekends didn't exist. Your, your weekend was you wake up at 6am when he woke up <laughs> because he came barging in the room and he would start doing Reveille. Oh my God. And he wouldn't stop until you got your ass out of bed. And then if you're getting... If you're taking too long in the shower, he'll douse you with water. Even though you're in the shower, that was his way of joking around. So he's just had this very goofy way of uh, of acting. So I look, I'm I'm glad about that. Like he wasn't he wasn't a hard ass. He was um, he was tough, but it was fair. Okay, like uh, growing up. So wow. But yeah, growing up at waking up again six a.m. <laughs> to go build a fucking fence or something. You know, that's <laughs> something that 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 it didn't require us to have to wake up at 6 a.m., but <laughs> still did it anyway, because, you know, he has to be done before noon. Nice. <laughs> yeah, another thing you mentioned before we um, started recording is a road trip through the United States. 
Yes. Yes. In um, 2006, I believe it was, me and a group of friends took a Subaru Outback and we just headed roughly 6,200 miles on a road trip wow. um, across the country. Mostly stuck to highways, but we, we had friends that lived in other states that we could stop by our friends' parents' houses or or we would... I had a cousin that lived in Seattle. So you know, we went from from Massachusetts. We started in Worcester, drove through New York, Pennsylvania, and we we ended up in Iowa because we had a friend that lived in Iowa and you know, cut through Nebraska, which is just uh, apologies for anyone who lives in Nebraska. <laughs> you know, just you, you can snooze through that one. It's just cornfield <laughs> after cornfield. And then went from there to Denver, Colorado. Oh. And my memories of Colorado we climbed St. Mary's Glacier just outside of Denver. I could be wrong about that, but I had a pair of boots that I used to hike up St. Mary's Glacier and they ripped Ooh. and I ended up having to change into whatever was in my backpack. And the only thing I had was a pair of flip flops because I knew we were going <laughs> to end up at a pool or something later on. And I climbed the rest of St. Mary's Glacier in flip flops. Wow. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> Went to Red Rocks. I visited Red Rocks and not during a show. I wish I had gone to see a show there, but it was, uh, yeah, it's a lovely area. I'd love to go and actually spend more time in Denver. I remember going into the city to go check out this um, Mexican restaurant that we were supposed to go check out. I, to this day, I can't remember what it was. The, they had a transit system, like a free transit system, and you could just hop in and just take yourself to wherever you need to go and nice. across the city. So I, I remember doing that. And um, we went from there... We cut around, so we ended up going through Utah, Arizona, and then we worked our way up to Portland, Oregon. Portland, Oregon was really nice. There was, um, I went to a, the biggest used bookstore. I don't know if it's still there, but it was, I don't, I don't think it is, but it was called Powell's. And if you ever make your way there, go, if, if it's still there, I don't think it is, but at least look it up. That was a really neat site. If you ever watch any YouTube videos on, on that, that's a, it was a really great site to see. Then we shot up to Seattle. I remember going to Pike's Place and then and Pike's Place is a really long you know infamous set of stairs to go check out all the sites of Seattle and I remember going on this journey just walking around Seattle we went to the, see the Space Needle saw the um, the Rock and Roll Museum so the Sci-Fi Museum and at the end when we were going down to our car which is down at Pike's Place which is this big fish market oh, okay. and to, in order to get down to that fish market you have to go through this really long set of stairs. I felt like a lot longer than probably actually was but what happened was right before going down to that area I busted my ankle. I don't know what happened but my I don't know if this ever happened to you, but your foot just kind of curves in such a way when you're walking and your ankle just kind of pops out Ouch. and that happened right before having to get down to the car Ouch. on that set of stairs. It was the most excruciating pain. Um, I basically was out of commission for the rest of, for like 24 hours just because of that. Ooh. But, um, but see, Seattle itself is really pretty. Um, there's a lot of, of course, coffee shops as in, as is Portland. Portland's mm -hmm. got a lot of pretty, um, uh, cobblestone walkways and coffee shops that are just it's just gorgeous and but yeah seeing with seattle the thing with seattle is it's not as foggy as you hear it is it's 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 actually really lovely and a clear day you can see the tetons it, i mean sorry mount rainier it's just a gorgeous site i have been looking forward to going back out there because i my close friend still lives out there and uh i keep telling him i'm going to make it out there a day and go visit. He's like, you got, I got a free bed for you. I'm like, I know, but yeah, I'll have to make a, a special trip out there. And uh, once you got to Seattle, did you um, fly back to Massachusetts? Nope, or drove back, drove. So then okay. from Seattle, drove through Idaho, Montana, and we stayed at Yellowstone National Park for a day and a half. And that's a sight to see. We got there late at night. And when we got there, we set up our camp and a brown bear came by Ooh, our tent shit. <laughs> and scared the shit out of me. But luckily, we didn't have anything set out. We didn't have anything. We didn't have any food, actually, because we had we, we were kind of like, oh, well, we're not going to bring food to Yellowstone. We don't know what we're going to prepare ourselves for. So we just didn't bring any food. We just we were only going to stay there for a little while and go out and get. But yeah, that was scary. A lot of caribou and a lot of a lot of buffalo. Like an egregious amount of buffalo to the point where like when we were trying to leave, we were in the middle of a herd of buffalo. And it's really lovely to see 
one Jesus. dominant buffalo just stand while the rest of the buffalo pack themselves across the road and you know everyone's just being respectful just you know waiting it out for 20 minutes but it's uh it's not like you had the choice you don't have a choice exactly <laughs> And then, yeah, we went from, oh, and saw Old Faithful. Old Faithful was really cool because, you know, you see it on YouTube and you're like, this is one thing, but actually be there is, is definitely a, a, uh, a game changer. I know what it is, but I cannot it's think the, of it right it's now. It's that geyser that, that's, yes. yeah. yeah. Okay. You, so you actually okay. see YouTube videos of the Old Faithful guys are shooting out and you just hear, oh, and ah, but actually seeing it's <laughs> a lot cooler. And then went from there to Mount Rushmore. So we drove through Yellowstone mm-hmm. and ended up at Mount Rushmore. And that's a, a pass. If oh. you've seen it on a Google picture of Mount Rushmore, that's all you need. Because you have to pay the admission to go any closer than to where, you know, photo, qual- you know, right before you get to the gate. Hey, I'm here at Mount Rushmore. And then we didn't even pay the admission. You know, you get the free shot and then, you know, call it a day. But there's not, there's <laughs> not, you know, you don't get to climb on top of Mount Rushmore, like in North by Northwest, nothing like that. You just, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you just, uh, you just get a little bit closer and that's really it. Um, so then, and then we went from Mount Rushmore and then I remember going from there, I remember going around the, before we get to the border of Canada. Okay. So we ended up in Chicago at some point to Detroit. So we went under through Indiana into Detroit and then went from Detroit to Buffalo. So we did go, we had to show our passports. I think we did. Because this was after 9-11, so everything was passports. Um, mm, so, yeah, okay. we went from Detroit to Buffalo and then spent the day at Niagara Falls. And that was that was okay. the closer. And then from Niagara Falls, we headed home. So um, that entire trip, how long did it take? Um, 11 days, 10, 10, 11 days. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, and uh, um, imagine intense. what your legs feel like when you're crammed in a Subaru Outback for 11 days. <laughs> you know, <Yeah>. non, <laughs> not nonstop, but, you know, enough driving after a while. And it's funny because my friend who it was his car was driving. He's as much of a music person as I am, but we have two different tastes in music and he was insistent that he wanted to hear his own music <laughs> instead of what I wanted to hear. <laughs> so imagine being in a car with someone that wouldn't let you play your music the entire car ride. Eventually you you put on some headphones and I had I bought I, I remember buying a portable DVD player so mm. I watched, you know, a couple movies, um, especially through the states that, you know, you could do that in like uh Nebraska, Iowa. Yeah, Nebraska. <laughs> but yeah, it was a good time. Um have you seen places in Europe? No. Um I wish that and again, bucket list items. I would love to go mm-hmm. around the Mediterranean. Um, you know, when I was younger, I wanted to backpack there, but I, again, everything was always money related. I couldn't afford this and I couldn't afford that. I just felt like uh, I'll never be able to do this stuff while I'm engaged or while I'm with my girlfriend or, you know, now it, it didn't hit me until I, my father had spoken up and said, go do that with your kids. And well, so there's a lot I'd like to do moving forward, but no pen to paper yet. So we'll see what hopefully a European vacation will, uh, uh-huh. where, where that will be. But I'd like to visit, there's a number of places, I, pretty much anywhere I'd, I'd love to visit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, back to music. What is your favorite music movie? But actually, uh, wait, first, mm-hmm. what would be your top three bands? <sighs> well, I can give you my top two, and that's kind mm-hmm. of the you know, Beatles, which is such a you know throwaway answer because everyone is the Beatles. But that's okay. <laughs> um, yeah, Beatles, and then Queen. I'm a big fan of Queen. Um, there are people that we know that love Queen, <laughs> main, namely one yes. person that we know that loves, loves Queen a little <laughs> bit more. But yeah, I really, really like Queen. And then a third, I couldn't tell you, you know, it's, you throw a dart at any big band. I, I, know, I, I love it all. Well, how about give me top five? Top five, goodness. Top five would be Beatles and Queen. And okay, three, four, five, go. Well, how about this? Someone that I've really been liking, I wouldn't put it in like top, but only because it's so fresh, you know. But recently I've been really liking uh, Beth Hart, also because she's just such a dynamite voice. I believe she is, I, I think she's LA native. Okay. She's kind of a bluesy rock, straight rock and roll from like the mid 90s. She was doing a couple albums with Joe Bonamassa and a couple um, solos and with bands. And, but yeah, I really like her. I, cause I first heard her in the Beth Hart band in 95 and I liked it, but wasn't on board. And then it wasn't until maybe like the last couple of years that I was, something came up and I was like, oh, I got to hear this because I had spent a long time since I've heard and just ended up buying every album. So that's nice. something more recently. But top bands, I mean, wh- what do you say? You know, Rolling Stones, The Who, Van Halen, you know, 80s and 
nothing really from the 90s. I, it's sad to say because there's a lot of great music that came out in the 90s that I can never really say that I put in my top favorite bands of all time. But I wish I could because so much great music that just went under my radar because at the time growing up it was grunge and Mm -hmm. grunge is kind of a hit or miss right you know you people really loved nirvana i thought they were okay and you know allison chains and soundgarden and a bunch of bands that just i i don't know some people might put them in their favorite bands but music of that generation just never yeah it's not for everyone either you know yeah yeah (laughs) <laughs> uh, there is nothing wrong with uh, not liking uh, <laughs> yeah, X and it's, Y. It's, I feel bad because uh, you know most people say, oh, well, your favorite music is usually the ones you grew up with as a teenager. But that I can't say the same for myself because um, I was mostly keen on the 80s. The 80s is really my if, if something is playing from the 80s, I'll, I pretty much never skip it. You know, it's, it's, uh, mm-hmm. it's like comfort food to me. All right. No, that sounds yeah. good. <laughs> because that's what I grew up with. Yeah, <laughs> so I, exactly. I approve. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, okay, back to the list. What is your favorite music movie? Recently, I, I rewatched Roger Waters' The Wall, mm-hmm. um, which I saw that concert. It's probably going to answer what's my favorite concert. That was my favorite show that I had been to. And seeing it again, in a movie documentary-ish format, um, was a little bit more fuller, even though it, uh, the experience is nothing like seeing it live. But seeing some added footage that was a little more personal to Roger Waters was really interesting. And there's some little s- side stories in it that are really touching. So I, I, I was thinking about that one recently. Okay. And what about your least favorite one? That's a good question. Least favorite music movie. Do musicals count? <laughs> yes. For, for, yeah, for this question, they absolutely do. <laughs> I couldn't finish Into the Woods. I don't know if uh, you've ever heard Into of that one. Into the Woods. That's like a Disney musical fantasy. Uh, what, which year was that? Ooh, um, maybe 10 years ago. Okay, doesn't yeah, uh, pass. Not sure. <laughs> okay, yeah, okay, I will. <laughs> I know you don't like musicals. That one's a hard yeah. pass for you. <laughs> okay, yeah, I will keep on ignoring it. Yeah. Then. <laughs> All good. Okay, so um, next question would be, what is your favorite book related to music? Well, I will admit I'm not a reader. I would rather do Audible. Like I just like books on tape. Mm-hmm. Everything has to be done auditorially. If I read a book, I'll fall asleep. It's 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 bad. I wish I didn't have that. But I did check out recently, and it's not my favorite. It's only because I can't think of a favorite. But I did recently check out. It's called Running with the Devil, and it was the Van Halen story told by the road manager. Oh, and his name is Noel Monk. It's fascinating to hear it from his own voice. Like I think that's the benefit to hearing some audible stories. You can actually hear the author. They put it their own inflection on it. So mm-hmm. it's um, that was more interesting because you can kind of hear both sides in his own telling of the story. Part of it, yeah, the band they were uh, young kids that were a bunch of jerks that were that did you know <laughs> stupid stuff. But it's also told by an, someone who was a little bit older and at that time probably. You, you can tell he's got a grudge against something that happened, ah. you know, 40 years ago. Okay. So when you're listening to it, it's like, I can, I hear what you're saying in most parts, but every now and then you just hear a little whiny baby telling a story <laughs> about uh, this grudge that he has against a band from 40 years ago. So a little bit of both sides on it. I mean, they weren't, they weren't Motley Crue bad, but destroying hotel rooms, how, what band in that era didn't. But you still kind of know where he comes from. Exactly. Kind because, of. you know, he thinks that he's going to get this band to creating under his tutelage, he's going to kind of play the the father role and and get them to to start him and he's going to get the attention and he just he i think he just wants everything to be nice and neat and under his direction and it just you've got david lee roth and eddie van halen and, and all these <laughs> you know these these four guys that just yeah. want to party and, and and sing songs and and it's just uh it just turns into a shit show so yeah i guess they i mean they did make it after all but it didn't go as smoothly as he would have hoped not at all and he and, <laughs> and spoiler he didn't last <laughs> once once david lee roth was ah, out okay. he was out as well it was not his uh what, how, what am i trying to say yeah not his decision thank you okay interesting yeah check it out it's uh it's a, it's a good weekend read okay yeah <laughs> or listen if you're like me and can't do books <laughs> all right Okay, so next question. What was your first concert? 
menudo. <laughs> okay. I always joke about this because it's um it's the it's one of the worst first concerts that you could say admit to, but I, I have to come clean. Yeah, it was menudo in uh, 1988. Um, in Puerto Rico, I was uh, spending the summer in San Juan and at my grandparents' house. And uh, my uncle, he is, I think was at the time, was like a director on Channel 2. Now, back at the time, Puerto Rico had like five or six channels, maybe four. <laughs> and, you know, one was news and one was telenovelas and the Spanish soap operas. And then, and then, mm-hmm. and then one or two were American broadcasts. And one of them was translated in Spanish with the dubbed over in Spanish. And the other one was, was, was speaking in you know American English. So he was the director of that channel. He had the band come to perform at the studios in, I believe it was in Hato Rey. And Hato Rey was right beside San Juan. It's, it's, you know, it's like a sub area of of san juan Mm -hmm. and um we went to see the band performed there and my sister had a huge crush on one of the members at the time not not ricky martin but another member his name was sergio and they were kind of flirting with each other backstage after the show and she joked about like oh i love him i love him and then the next like a minute later he gets busted for marijuana possession at an (laughs) airport and (laughs) <laughs> that manager and that the the organization for Menudo they run a tight ship. So since that press got leaked a day later, he was like out of the band. <laughs> so oh, wow. And the the turnover for Menudo members is like you know once you turn sixteen, it's like Logan's run. They just <laughs> <they> disappear, <laughs> and, the, and then a new batch of members comes in to that boy <laughs> band. Nice reference. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> Good shout. <laughs> but yeah, that that was unfortunately was my first concert. <laughs> unfortunately. Um. Okay. So then you're favorite or most memorable concert is what you mentioned a few minutes ago the wall yes the wall loved it um saw that in fenway park oh okay and i was just a couple rows behind jack black and tom brady we were in the front we were we were in the front we uh i have this gift for purchasing concert tickets with good seats just a week or two before the performance so i'll find ways to like either find people you know on, online or, or people that are preparing to go because you can go to StubHub and and sell your ticket but some people know that you want to give it to an honest person so I, I usually scout those people out so i can try to find some decent seats but i never like to go and get tickets right when they go on sale because i never have luck it's like it's same thing with like winning concert tickets on a radio like i'm never going to be the fifth caller i'll always be the sixth or the eighth but the same goes for trying to score tickets on like Ticketmaster. it just ne- <laughs> it never happens like when i finally get on after waiting for thousands of other people to buy their tickets then i'm you know i'm in the rafters so i i always <laughs> just decide i'm just gonna wait till like the week or two before the show and i'll find someone that needs to let go of their tickets and i have been lucky nine times out of ten nice. but yeah that was that was one of them like we got to see the wall just a few rows from the stage and it was breathtaking just to be there and you know you see the giant inflatable pig go through the, the mm-hmm. through the air and and it's like right over your head and it ju- it's just it's just a mesmerizing experience but you can only partially live vicariously through that through the watching it on uh, on DVD or Blu-ray but being there was pretty uh, pretty magnificent all right i can imagine next question what was the scariest concert crowd you've ever been caught in well for this one i have two <laughs> so one of them was actually at my bachelor party so on my bachelor party we went to portland maine and the old port which is like a, a cobblestone area with bar and bar and bar and a bunch of bunch of downtown bars where you can go drinking and uh, go eat in restaurants and stuff and unfortunately not unfortunately I, i'll take that back but my wife was also having her bachelorette party in the old port on the same day okay so unfortunate timing is what i'll say so we had to spend the later half of the bachelor party when we were out drinking trying to make sure that we didn't run into you know my my then fiance so at one point we were about to go to a bar and my friend said i'm gonna go in first and and make sure that she's not there and he comes out and he goes she's in there we got to go into this other one so (laughs) they hurry me into a bar and there's a band playing that's screaming death metal. Oh. And I'm not a screaming death metal guy. <laughs> so when I walked in there with a bunch of my friends, you know, there's a it's basically a, a glorified living room that with the lights <laughs> off and you know and strobe lights on. And my friend thought it was funny. You know, we're standing at the entrance 
And it's just a big metal mosh pit in a very tiny room. Jesus. And there's bottles of beer that's breaking and everyone's throwing and people are on the floor and and you can i i thought i heard bones breaking it was just scary but my friend thought it would be funny to shove me into the crowd as a joke and i was in a full-on mosh metal pit not my decision and uh (laughs) but i got him back because if you've ever taken a glass bottle of beer and hit someone else's bottle of beer on the top with your bottle of beer yeah the mm-hmm. beer will overflow in their hands. Yes. <laughs> and uh, he got pretty soaked by that. So I got him back. Kind of. <laughs> yeah. So that was that was the scare, the first scariest. Uh, but the second scariest, um, I didn't actually stay for the show. Um, it was at a festival and it was the band Slayer. Oh. And I'm not a Slayer guy. I'm, again, having to do with that screaming metal music. Mm-hmm. I like certain metal bands, like heavy metal. Like I'm, I'll listen to Metallica all day long, but it has to be a melodic to a degree. Mm-hmm. That's just not my bag, you know, to each their own. But yeah, that at a festival, like I caught about 15 minutes of Slayer and it was dicey. And I just, uh, I basically went to the merch booth after that. Cause I just, I couldn't, I couldn't take it. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. So next question, is there a band that turned you into a fan after you saw them live? Um, yeah, I went to see a band called rise against mm-hmm. and When I went to see Rise Against, there was an opening band that no one had heard of at the time um, called the Gaslight Anthem. And they are, I don't know when the last time they put out an album, maybe in the last seven, eight years, but I could be wrong. But yeah, they they really blew me away. They had this sort of Bruce Springsteen-y with like a more more rocking, like more newer rocking edge, like, like something that... It was like a harder version of Bruce Springsteen is the best way to describe okay. it. It was so different, you know, that it brought back something old, but in a new way. And um, I really liked them after that. I don't think I've caught any of their later albums, but their first album was uh, was pretty dynamite. All right. Uh, next question. What is your most memorable brush with fame? I don't know if this really counts as a brush with fame, but I, you know, I, I went to a couple like pop culture conventions in on the East coast. So I've been to one in Philadelphia and one in Hartford, Connecticut. And so I've met like a couple movie stars, I guess, so to speak. So I have seen like Patrick Stewart. Oh, I have a picture with Linda Hamilton. Oh, okay. And I got her autograph. Um, uh, Bruce Campbell from the evil dead series. Um, mm-hmm. is really cool. He's a really nice guy. I uh, met uh, Thomas Jane and, and David Arquette. Okay. And, and just a bunch of, you know, not, not like super a list, but you know, at the time they were doing movies that were pretty big. What, uh, what about like, uh, random interactions, like coincidences? I'm trying to think if I ever even have any brush with anybody. I, I mean, like I said, yeah, I'm, I saw Jack Black and Tom Brady from a Yeah, distance. I was thinking maybe that's, <laughs> that's it. About, that's about, <laughs> I never had the guts to like call, uh, you know, I it just didn't, I didn't want to be that guy. I said, hey, you know, but it's, yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think that's about it. I, d- I don't really get to see people randomly that that's, uh, I just don't have the luck, I guess. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> that's absolutely all right. Uh, next question. What piece of music memorabilia would you like in your house? Uh, I know everybody has said Eddie Van Halen's guitar. Um, mm-hmm. That's a good one. I want Neil Peart's drum set. All right. Okay. <laughs> I just want a room with just Neil Peart's drum set. And I just want to basically, they, I don't know if you've ever seen this, but you know, in Boston and a bunch of big cities, they have these places that you can go in. And if you're just pent up with rage and, and anger, you just can break glass. Like you can take, you can put on a suit, like a hazmat type suit and yeah, yeah. You know, put on a green protect visor over your face and, and just take a, a weapon of your choice and just break glass and break old computers and break old TVs. I don't have that kind of frustration to, or anger in my, in, <laughs> in myself, but I would love if, you know, if ever, if I, I felt like, oh gosh, I'm frustrated. I would just want to tool around on Neil Burt's drum sets. <laughs> I have the game Rock Band and Guitar Hero, you know, yeah, yeah. and it, come, it came with mm-hmm. a drum set. I kept that damn thing. It still works. Every now and then I'll, I'll plug that thing in. Just go, burr, 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 burr. It's not a real drum yeah, set, yeah, it's a toy, but it's, it's so much fun to just hear it through your speakers like you're in an arena. So, yeah, that, that would probably be me buying. I had a rock band for many years you as did? well. Yeah. And I so gave, much fun. Yeah, I gave it to my nephew a few years ago and he's still using Good it. Good for him. Actually. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, I don't, it's old. It's, it's on an old, older Xbox and I never play. Like, I just, who has to? 
time to, you know, and it's, I love to just set it up and just, just go in the little demo and just go, bah, bah, bah. you don't even have to play us one of those songs. There's actual like a feature yeah, where you can just play. And mess yeah, around. I love it. It's great. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we can switch to the triple Q's, the quick and quirky questions. Let's do it. All right. Let's do it. Question one, would you rather speak all languages or play all musical instruments? Mm, I'm fluent in Spanish. That was one of my yeah. questions, actually. Did you, when you were a kid, did you speak a mix of English and Spanish at home or? Kind of. My mother and father only spoke Spanish to each other. So I just picked it up probably within the last 15 years. Yeah, I can just go to the in and out. Actually, probably even later, long, longer than that. I'll give you an example. So we could be talking about my favorite band and, and in the middle of my sentence, yo puedo hablar con de, de otros grupos nuevos que, o, o viejos, dependiente de lo que tú tienes, uh, but, and then go right back into English. Uh, okay. and, and so, <laughs> you know, I can go flirt in and out of English and Spanish, and um, I'm glad I can do that. So, Gladly, that's, you know, from the, at least from the U.S., North America, those two are the dominant languages. So I, I would mm -hmm. say yes. that, and I do want to know French. That is a tough one. I hate to say I probably would want to know, be able to play all instruments. Um, and all right. knowing all languages would benefit me more. But the fact that I have such a tenacity to play and try to master when I can a song. I would love to be able to do it through different types of guitars or different type of and pretty much anything. I'm, I'm game for whatever. If it, the opportunity arose and I could just learn all instruments, I would, but boils down to time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. All right. Question two. If you could get a ticket to any show or event, what would you want a ticket to, past or present? There's a couple. I mean, the go-tos, obviously, you know, there's Live Aid, Wembley. I, I know that Fistini mm -hmm. had mentioned going to JFK. I know. I, I don't want to see Led Zeppelin's <laughs> <laughs> troubled set. I would rather see Queen knock it out of the park. And the Us Festival, 83, that was pretty dynamite. Mm -hmm. Those are the two go-tos. If it was like a single band performance... Going back to Queen, they, they played a show in 82 when they were touring with Hot Space at the Milton Keynes Bowl in England. And that's a really cool DVD. Um, I would have loved to have seen that show. There's a performance that Freddie does of somebody to love that's it, hearing it. Even if you're just watching it on YouTube with tiny little rinky dink speakers, your jaw will drop. It's so well done. Um, and it, you just hear you know, everything you've ever heard about, if you've never heard Freddie Mercury before, that would be what I'd play for someone so that they got it. It's yeah, so quite the introduction. Yeah, it's so good. <laughs> um, so I'd say that one. Yeah. Good shout. Uh, next question. What is your favorite insect? Hmm. My favorite insect. Um, everybody says the bee. Well, that's a, that's a good answer. The bee. You know, if I'm not going to be a bee, I'd be... Well, I mean, you don't have to be one. You just... Oh, good. <laughs> it's just your favorite insect. That's it. <laughs> I don't know why I thought in, your, in previous times you had asked what you'd want to be. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll go with the bee because I, I, I can't think of anything really that... You know, anything else that you, you're trying to think of something cool, it's always something that's more and more dangerous or, or something that has to live in just bile. And it's no thanks. Or butterfly. <laughs> yeah, butterflies are neat and, and ladybugs. I, I get, I'm going to go with the bees since they're so damn important to our, our uh, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, to this planet Earth. So <laughs> that's not good. Uh, next question: Which scene from a movie scarred you for life? This is another twofer. Um, so the first one that scarred me for life was also the first horror movie I technically ever watched, and I say technically because I was really young. I might have been five, and I was. <laughs> Um, my my sister and my mother were watching a, a movie um, called It's Alive. Yeah, I remember it. Do you know it? I've okay. seen it, yeah. Okay, so <laughs> if you remember at the beginning of the movie, there's a mother who's giving birth. And, you know, all of a sudden it just goes into the father getting it. I think it was like a distress call or he was going into the hospital. And there was just bloody corpses all around because, you know, <laughs> the, the baby has to be this crazy mutated killer death baby. But... You know, I was, I was walking in the room and my mother goes, don't, don't come in here. Don't come in here. <laughs> so she sends me to the kitchen, which is right in the room next to the living room where the TV is. And there's a mirror facing opposite the TV. And I'm in the kitchen <laughs> looking in the mirror 
watching the movie reflected on the TV. <laughs> and she thinks that I'm I'm just can hear it, but I'm actually watching this movie and, and I'm horrified at what I'm watching. <laughs> and that probably was what helped instigate my interest in, in horror movies, much to my mother's chagrin because she uh, hates them. But it's uh yeah that uh, that might have caused my little love for horror movies um the second one is was more um terrifying only because i had the chicken pox um mm. when i was seven and i was bedridden and my parents went out they went out on a date and they left me with the tv remote and i remember putting it on a channel and the exorcist was playing and i couldn't <laughs> get out of bed i was so sick but the TV remote batteries died oh, and I couldn't whoa. get up to change, turn the TV off because I was scared to get out of my bed, <laughs> but I couldn't stop watching the movie. And I'm just watching this horrible things happen to this little girl who's also bedridden throughout the yes. movie. <laughs> and that was truly traumatic. Yeah, that was just nightmare fodder. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Traumatic to this day. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, that's good timing yeah. for for the batteries to fail. <laughs> yeah, no Jesus. kidding. So yeah, I can say yeah, I've seen uh, The Exorcist way before I should have. Um, <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and and that also brings up a, a point. Now that I'm thinking about it, I don't know if this is true for parents nowadays, but I'm, I, I can definitely speak for myself here. But back then, my parents had no problems with me watching R-rated movies before. Like I should have been watching R-rated movies. Like I. I watched a ton of R-rated movies when I was like seven, eight, nine years old. I don't know if that was a thing or if my parents were just really bad at, <laughs> at fostering my <laughs> my innocence. But yeah, that was, um, I remember watching so many movies at an early age, you know, like Predator, Die Hard. Like they should <laughs> not have been watching those movies when they came out. But yeah, lo and behold, <laughs> I uh, maybe that's what made me a diehard movie freak. Maybe. Uh, next question. What is the best nickname you've ever heard? Oh, that one's easy. <laughs> this is so this is another story. When my wife and I were dating, we used to chat on instant messenger mm -hmm. that was america online yeah yeah like uh, it was a uh, aim like uh, icq and uh, you know, yeah, you know yeah, yeah. okay okay yeah. sorry i didn't i, I was no it's okay um <laughs> no but problem. yeah that we would chat uh that way when we couldn't talk on the phone and all of a sudden i remember getting a chat from from a new screen name and the screen name said titty vixen <laughs> <laughs> and i said what the hell is this and it was just like asking me like hey cutie what are you doing tonight then i started chatting with my my girlfriend angela now my wife i was telling her, i was like somebody named titty vixen is chatting me up <laughs> really strong <laughs> and it was her <laughs> playing ah. a joke on me with her oh, with her friend but to this day even the word titty just makes me think of that <laughs> Um, so anytime I say that word to her, she just cracks up. She was testing you. She, I think she was. Yeah. yeah. And I guess you passed. <laughs> I, I did. Cause I was, I, yeah, I was like, what? <laughs> check this person out. Who the hell? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Had you not mentioned it, yeah, then trouble. you probably would have been in trouble. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. That's, that's my sliding doors moment there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. Maybe. Maybe. Okay. So, um, next question. What would you name your boat if you had one? Hmm. I don't know. They say to name it after a, a lady, so I guess name name it after. Usually, but you don't. We, yeah, you, know, you don't have <laughs> to. I, I'd probably name it Sophia after my daughter. But I, since that's such a cop, but I'm going to tell you this story because this this will make up for that. My weak answer. I was <laughs> okay. uh, when I was starting out in the insurance, my insurance job. I was taking claims for homeowners insurance, so, so homeowners claims, and I'd get calls from insurance agents. And one time, I got a call from an insurance agent who was calling me, and he patched me through, I guess, yeah, I guess an attorney through the legal department. He was putting in, helping me put in the claim because he had all this information about the client. What had happened was his client was out on Boston Harbor mm -hmm. on a boat that he had packed with like 14 or 15 friends and they channeled like a private island off the harbor. And half of them, I believe, were underage, uh, under the age of 21. And one of the guests was a 19 year old girl and this is this is not funny but what's ironic will be what later what later comes so she is drunk and falls off the boat and goes swimming and the guy turns on the boat 
to reverse it to head back while she's in the water. Mm. She catches the propeller blade and it severs her arm. Oh, Jesus. Okay. They, you know, Harbor Patrol gets involved. They arrest him and, and he gets, I think he ultimately admits guilt. I think it was a back and forth about admitting guilt and not admitting guilt. I, th- I think ultimately he had to do like 200 hours of, of community service, which I think was having to go to like a, a hospital ward for victims of, you know, who had severed limbs and things like that. So mm-hmm. it was a pr- apropos. But the ironic part about it was that his boat was named not guilty. Oh, Jesus. Spell <laughs> N-A-U-T. And when he told me this whole story, you know, the, he was telling me the charges at the time because the rest of it didn't, you know, hadn't unfolded. But it, he was like laughing about it. And I'm like, I don't know if you should be telling me this whole story, but I, you know, I'm just a listener. I'm just taking the call. <laughs> but yeah, I'll, I'll never forget that story. Wow. Yeah, that's uh, a, <laughs> that's appropriate. I know, ironic. <laughs> not, not hilarious, but just I, super ironic. I was like, Boy, yeah, it made newspapers around here. <laughs> I bet. Yeah. All right. So next question. Where is the worst smelling place you've ever been? On the way to University of Maine, there is a chicken mill that smells like just holy hell. It smells awful. <laughs> that is just I never smelled. I mean, it's honestly, everything always boils down to shit. It just smells awful. <laughs> I, can't, I know people have uh, you know better answers. But yeah, when I when I was going there. Luckily, I didn't have a car, so I didn't have to drive in and out of that town to experience that. But whenever I did, oof, I it was just it was the worst smell I can think of. Uh, that works. <laughs> yeah. And University of Maine, by the way, just n- not to go off on a tangent, that was a happy accident. When I was in high school, I didn't do very well. Again, like like I said, in, in, I didn't do well in, in University of Maine, but I didn't do well in high school either. I, I scathed through through the you know, skin of my teeth just to get a passing grade. And so I was happy to just have any college accept me. And there was, you know, there was only a few. And I remember my mother asking me, well, which one do you want to pick? And I remember just kind of going, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, this one. <laughs> And it was University of Maine. And had I not gone to University of Maine, I would have never met my wife. Oh, wow. Okay. So that's a sliding doors. That's my sliding. I know we're jumping the gun, but that was my sliding doors moment. Cause I, it was such a, I mean, when you say random, I literally pointed at a letter and picked that one because you know, there was other colleges in the, within the same distance, but that was the one that I just randomly picked. And why Maine? I, have, I couldn't tell you to this day, probably because it just sounded so far away and I just wanted to get out of my hometown. <laughs> but yeah, had I not gone there, things would have turned out much different. Wow. All right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so next question. When did you screw everything up, but no one ever found out it was you? Um, there was one that I almost got away with. I'd never done one where I had got away with it clean. But this one, when I was... 20, my sister at a lake house in a really nice little area was that she actually, her husband had their family house that he inherited because um, his mother moved out and they gave, she gave them the house. It's a really nice house in a very ritzy town. Mm -hmm. And they put me in charge of um, house sitting while they went to the White Mountains for like a weekend getaway. Could have even been an anniversary. I don't remember. But you put a 20 year old in charge of a house, an empty house. Let's just say that friends were called and, and kegs of beer were brought in. And it was supposed to only be seven, eight people tops, you know, just a small group, like a poker gang, like a group, you know, just some, just mm-hmm. small group, just to shoot the shit with. But you know, it's like the telephone game yeah. where you tell one person <laughs> and they invite two people. Long story short, there were about 50 people that ended up at the house and people brought firecrackers, fireworks, um, you know, people came in and were just like making huge loud noises. And it was like a, watching a movie. It was just like, <laughs> this is going to be a disaster that ends horribly. And we got an alert that the police were called. So it was like we were trained operatives. We shut the lives, <laughs> like, lights off. We made the house pitch black. Everyone hid. Um, people hid in, in the bushes. People hid under the couch. And you, we just saw, you could see because no lights were on, you could see the police light, just flashlight, just dash through the living room you know it's like a searchlight just like going in and out and then it was gone and we had someone that was 
that was in, in the road, like, like keeping watch, like, okay, they're gone, gone. You can keep going. You turn the lights back on. And we probably, oh, I can't imagine how much we pissed off. I would never want to meet those neighbors. Oh, if I ever saw them, I had a thousand apologies. But yeah, I must have pissed off those neighbors something fierce. So we cleaned up the house the next day. It was just awful. It's just people were just <laughs> on the floor the next day, the next morning. Um, people just, just scurrying off or like shoveling off. And as me and Angela, my, and we were just trying to clean up and she had to go. Um, and I was just trying to make the house sparkling clean. And it, it was perfect. She got, she came to the house. They didn't recognize any difference. It, it was perfect. It looked wow. exactly the way they left it. And I was like, I got away with murder, right? <laughs> and hopefully the neighbors just shut their mouths and we're fine, which I knew was never going to happen. But what happened next was I got back home and not even two hours later, I got a call from my sister and she's screaming at me. What the fuck did you do? What did you do? And I was like, <laughs> what, what, what we, how did you, how did you find out? Somebody left a beer inside the microwave. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, whoops. The one place I didn't look to clean up was definitely going to be inside their microwave. So that's and then probably, you know, the next day or two, the neighbors are like, yeah, thanks for coming home. But yeah, that that was the time that I almost got away with it without. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> nice. All right. And there was no other damages to the house. No. We got lucky. Um, I had a friend that lost an Omega watch, which uh, we, we joke about to this day. Uh, no damage. I mean, it was just, I guess everyone just kind of on the honor system. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nobody, nobody get hurt and, and just take care of each other. Uh, it was a keys party. Obviously, everyone had their keys collected and no one left drunk. So we were pretty responsible in that regard. But um, yeah, otherwise, boy, a bunch of stupid kids. <laughs> Yep, roger that. <laughs> Question number 10. If you were given a one-minute ad slot during the Super Bowl, what would you fill it with? I'd probably do something to promote. Lately, we've been seeing, we've been making some progress in this in these last few months. Mm -hmm. um, and secretly and quiet, because of current events, we see a lot of things change for the better. You know, we're seeing black actors and black entertainers and Asian actors and Asian entertainers come in, into the mix. And it's, you know, when I was a kid, it was always white movie stars and, and white rock stars. And, and you never, I never saw someone on TV that looked like me then say, Oh, I want to be like that. It was always someone that was a, a, you know, a white person that I could not physically relate to. Mm -hmm. And now we're starting to see, black movie stars and black uh, rock stars more in the mix, uh, you know, and female uh, stars. And it just, it's starting to feel like equality is coming into play, but I, I would like to probably do something that showcases Latin America in a way that people can really see that Latin America has a great mix of entertainers and, you know, showcase probably, you know, the clips of some really you know, interesting people that probably deserve their due mm -hmm. and, and, and do something like that. We're getting better and better, but let's go the extra mile and let's, let's, let's bring other races and, and ethnicities into the mix and, you know, put a spotlight on them. Let's put them front and center and, and really mix it up. Cause every, I mean, let's, let's be equals everybody, you know, that's probably what I'd do. Good answer. Okay. So overtime. Question one, you are going back in time and wind up face-to-face -face with 15-year-old you. You have 10 seconds before you travel back to the present day. What do you tell your younger self? Mm. I'd remind myself that you're going to be all right and learn a little bit more about history because, damn, it wasn't until, you know, as I got into more of an adult that I realized that history is so important. And, you know, if we don't, learn history. We're doomed to repeat the same mistakes over and over again. So grab some books, delve into whatever interests you, but just learn your history, learn the world history, learn about you know, other countries, other, other religions, anything that might pique your interest, but just, just go for it. And just, because that little bit will go a long way. I, I think that I, if I had started earlier, I would have had a much better grasp on the world around us, especially politically speaking, mm -hmm. because boy, if you don't do your history lessons, you, you just are doomed to be some ignorant asshole that storms the Capitol. You, know? <laughs> you just learn your history and you know, just, just learn about other people's mistakes so you don't repeat them.
Sounds good. Uh, next question. If you could live in anyone's head for 15 minutes, a la being John Malkovich, who would you choose? Oh. You could just observe. You couldn't control them. Yeah. That's a good question. Who would I... Gosh. You know, any rock star... Yeah, I don't know. That's a great question. You know who? Mm -hmm. Let's let's do um, Pete Townsend. Mm -hmm. I want to know what it's like to hear it as Pete Townsend. I bet it's just a constant ringing. <laughs> just, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, you know, just life experience alone, and you could just throw a dart at any big rock star just to see what life experiences they they must have had going around. Yeah, music wise, I, I wish I would I could go into like world leaders, you know, like, but I don't. Uh, yeah, just go with what I know, unfortunately. And yeah, let's, let's just let's just say any any great rock star of the '60s and '70s. All right, that works. Uh, question three: You're on death row. Tomorrow it's over, but you get to choose the way you will be executed. No matter the logistics, you can go big or small. How do you want to go? Oh, such a cop out the quietest way possible um whatever the least amount of pain because i'm such a wuss when it comes to that um <laughs> or if it has to be something horribly painful let it be funny <laughs> something that like <laughs> something that they, they put like in the obituary like wow this guy oof. that's messed up <laughs> yeah, that's crazy <laughs> Um, something that, yeah, but you know, something like that, but doesn't, doesn't hurt anybody else in the process. Right. Um, but if not that, then God, it's painless, whatever's painless. So if you want to, you know, up, up the morphine, mm -hmm. great, let's have it. All right. <laughs> Call it a day. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, next question. Your superpower is that you can give phobias to people. What would you make people afraid of? Gosh, it, you know, Steve-O had a really good one for this one. He's just like, you just, you can't. You have you can't take away free will from people. But if I'm gonna give an answer, give people phobias, gosh, just phobias of social stigmas, you know? Mm. Anything that's like anything that you know, those immediate fears you have of those biases that people have of um if someone is that they think is a thug and they immediately go to Am I Jeopardy? Am, am I safe? Mm -hmm. Just get rid of those phobias, you know, when they're not warranted. So yeah, and take away social stigmas. Just release that. Get rid of that yeah. altogether. Uh, yeah, good, good answer. Okay, um, would you rather win, let's say, two million dollars, tax free, no questions asked, or wake up tomorrow still in 2021 but 10 years younger? Let's do the money. One thing that I—it's uh, so cheesy, and it's just one of those, you know, those those little cheesy artworks that you buy at like a Hallmark store, but it's stuck with me for years. And it was, you can always make more money, but you can't make up more time. And that mm -hmm. is something that I took into heart a, a you know, while ago. And so I've been happy with the time that I've had, especially now where I'm working from home Mm -hmm. I don't, not everybody gets that opportunity. And I, I think about those that can't because it's, it's, um, it's so hard to have to go in and out of an office. I, and I've done commutes where it's, it's horrible. It takes an hour and you miss all that time with your loved ones. So, but that being said, I, I have pointed to that. I, I don't want to be 10 years younger. I think I did fine with what I did. I don't really have any regrets. I don't really want to go back and do things differently and, and, and like a butterfly effect, screw something up. Mm -hmm. but like you you would be like still now but 10 i'd years be 10 longer. years younger but but i'd be naive i think <laughs> i like i like where i'm at currently mm -hmm. but i think with the money i think i could do some definite experiences like i said you know like I, we were just talking about going traveling i think with money i could go and start right away so i think i'd take the money for that just so i could create those experiences um now rather than have to to wait to be able to afford it okay no yeah that works that works absolutely um okay so next question what is the best compliment you've ever received i like when somebody says like i thought about you when i got this oh it's just the little things you know just when someone just takes a moment of your time and they say that oh i thought about you because something reminded me of you or or i was just thinking about you and i, I wanted to send you this or it just i guess just that feeling of just so someone takes a moment of their time and, and everyone's got busy schedules. So um, just to know like, Hey, you know, I was thinking about you. That's enough for me. I, I can't think of anything you know, bigger than that. No. Yeah. That's uh, that's simple, but very good. Uh, next question. What is your hometown best known for? 
So I grew up in Shrewsbury, Massachusetts, and Shrewsbury actually just celebrated the 61st anniversary. There's a place that's down the road from where I grew up in, and the name of the place is called the, um, I'm going to butcher this, the Worcester Biological Research Institute, I think is what it's called. Mm -hmm. And there was a scientist that he met a lady that inspired him to work on something that would assist with, I'll just say it, they they ultimately ended up inventing the birth control pill. Oh, okay. He wasn't really interested in it, and he was, he was more interested in infertility, and she talked him into doing it because... I, I, I don't know if it was a, a, a little bit of a feminism thing at that time. I don't really know the answer behind it, but they worked together and with another scientist and they worked there. And that's where I believe um, most of the research and work was done to to create the birth control pill. Okay. I didn't know that. That's, yeah. that's really cool. <laughs> All right. Yeah, that that's the birthplace of that. And that was only, that's not even a mile and a half from, no, less than. It's, not, it's, like, it's like three quarters of a mile from my house so or my, okay. my house that i grew up in yeah all right okay so next question name me three items on your bucket list obviously traveling i mean that's loose but travel 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 yeah i think that it's so important to actually go to the places instead of getting pictures or watching youtube videos of places i mean we did a lot of that during the pandemic <laughs> um you know we did virtual museums with for the kid but yeah throw a dart at anywhere i'd love to go visit europe so that's on my bucket list i want to be in a band again mm. um not necessarily i don't want to you know be <laughs> I don't want to be in like a touring band, but I would like to be in like a, a like some sort of group of friends that you know just play gigs around town. So that those are two traveling the band, and a third one. You know what? I want to go to because I love movies so much. So I, this is kind of traveling again, but I, I am going to go to California and check out um, some of the things that would be related to movies. I hate to say Hollywood because it gets such a bad taste in most people's <laughs> mouths, but you know, just, just seeing just the idea of Hollywood and seeing some of the, the old, old Hollywood and, or seeing some of the sites and people who live in California, they're, they're like, okay, that's, that's lame because you know, I see that every day, but you know, I, I don't get to see that. And I, and I probably would create a list of things I'd want to go do. So I'd, I'd make a list of places I'd go see um, and then go do that. But again, that's all travel related. So it's kind of a cop out answer, Patrick. That's right. <laughs> I apologize. That's okay. I'll think of something better after. And then I'll be like, damn, I should have said that. That's no problem. Uh, all right. So next question. If you could have dinner with three people, dead or alive, who would it be? My, my mother's father is one of them because she always tells me that I remind her of him. Hmm. And because uh, he loved music a lot. He bought one of the first radios in Puerto Rico and he would play the radio. He would put it by the window because nobody had a radio and he would put it by the window so all the neighborhood kids could hear the, the radio shows or music and playing. Nice. And I guess he would just always play the radio and like morning to dark, you know, he, he loved everything. Like, and I kind of feel the same way. Like I just, I love a little bit of everything. Um, I do have some things I'm stronger at, but yeah, I'm just so open-minded with it that I think I would have loved to have a conversation with him. And that's like my one, two, three right there. I don't know. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I don't really have like any entertainers that I'm like, I'm dying to go and have a ch chat with Obama. I want to talk mm -hmm. with Obama. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. That would be a great conversation. And I don't have a go-to for a third one. In this question, are we all like sitting together and having dinner? Because that would be an awkward. Uh, that'd be that'd be an awkward conversation to have all all of us together. Well, But uh, I mean, yeah, <laughs> technically, yes, you would be. <laughs> I know that my 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 grandfather only spoke Spanish, so it would, but maybe. Oh yeah, language wouldn't be an issue. <laughs> ah, there you go. There's in this that. magical, There's, uh, in this magical scenario, yes, like we just all ah okay, yeah. I throw Gandhi in there. Let's yeah. chat with Gandhi. Yeah, good shout. Why not? Absolutely. <laughs> If language is not a barrier, then let's just... Oh, she, you know, she spoke it. English anyway, so... Yeah. <laughs> that's no problem. Actually, you, you know what? The Pope. I don't know why. I'm not I, I'm not super religious anymore, but he just seems like such a cool guy. I Just like open-minded, not like you know the previous Pope. Mm. That, it, it, he just seems more open-minded, more of the people. And I think if anything, that that's more what religion should be. It should just be of the people instead of, you know, some sort of dictatorship or political thing. Yeah, so. looking over them, 
down at yeah. them. Yeah. All right. So, okay. Next question. Okay. What is the biggest surprise you've had over the last few months? Biggest surprise? Actually, just yesterday. This is not, it's not a surprise because it's, it's definitely something that's going to be coming down the line. The movie theater down the road from me mm-hmm. is uh, just closed. And it's uh, you know, permanently closed for good. Yeah. Oh, that sucks. And um, I just see that that is something that's, it's something that seems foreboding across the board. And I worry not that, you know, because I get it. It's there's so many incentives to staying at home and watching movies. I fall under it too. I mean, they're marketing it in a way that you should just stay home because you can watch the same movie in the theater on the same day on TV. And that couldn't be controlled. You know, they, they still have to dish out the entertainment while we're all being quarantined. But now I, I only worry that it's going to be tougher for that industry to thrive again. It took such a dive. I hope that if they're going to reformulate that so that it's not such so cineplexy, I, uh, I, I don't know. I got mixed feelings about it, too. It's such a weird new world we live in, Patrick. I just want... Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I think even... Post virus, there will be a lot of um, things that will change, and many things that will never go back the way they were. You know exactly. And, and I know that many people that I know told me that it will take a lot of effort to get back to social uh, interactions like before. Yeah, people were. Somebody was told me it's like, well, I didn't get sick all year. I mean, why? Why don't I just keep the mask on all the time? And yeah, and it's hard to argue with that. Yeah, course, absolutely. You know. Um, so yeah, I think, I think there's going to be some changes that will help and I hope it's not fear based, but I think the bottom line is that it might turn a light bulb on and and we might do things for the better. But yeah, with, with movie theaters, I I don't know. I I got such a mixed feeling about that one because the industry I think is changing. It's kind of like the way I felt when music changed, right? When Mm -hmm. when you used to go to a record store and and pick up a CD and you just, cause you liked one song and you never would have found out you liked the rest of the album (laughs) better than the song that you went in there to buy the album for. And now you can kind of cherry pick everything on iTunes and who knows, you know, so there's convenience to it, but you lose something. And maybe maybe those changes were eventually coming to the movie uh, system, but maybe the pandemic accelerated everything. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So, and now I don't know if we're able to handle it the way we would have naturally. Yeah. So it's interesting to see what the next, or to think about what the next couple years are going to look like for that industry. We'll have to wait and see, I guess. <laughs> yeah. All right. So yeah, I guess next question, we have the answer already. What is your fork in the road? That one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I always think about that. And then the other fork in the road is like, we lucked out buying this house when we did. We weren't going to go to this open house to check out this house. We were mm-hmm. we were tired. We had looked at a hundred houses, Patrick. It was so tedious. And so like, even my daughter was like, do we have to go to another one? <laughs> I was like, no, we don't have to. But uh, we'll just do this one and it ended up being the one that we bought nice. you know we, we we just loved it and it, had we not found it we would have gotten fatigued and to take another break and we would have had to you know raise two small children in a tiny two-bedroom apartment so that and uh picking uh, university of uh, maine and maine meeting angela yeah. yes okay so that, there you go that's that's two good ones <laughs> uh so yeah that's the that's the end of the questions actor where can we find you online um, I'm on Facebook and Twitter. I'm at Classic Hexagon on Twitter. That just comes because my name is Hector and Hex, Hex, Hex my friends, and Hex just came down randomly. And then I always put the word classic in front of something just to make it funny. So yeah, Classic okay. Hexagon was the Twitter handle. And then I'm on Facebook, Hector Luis Contreras. So find me there. Excellent. All right. So thank you again for joining us today. Thank you, Patrick. I had a lot of fun. I'm glad to hear that. (laughs) It is the important thing for me. My guests need to have a good time. (laughs) Oh, absolutely. I'm with you. Awesome. So thank you everyone for listening and we will talk again soon. Thanks. 